And he said unto them, Thou hast said. And we know that Judas left the room at this time. And now Jesus institutes, <clears throat> excuse me, he institutes the Lord's Supper. First he picks up the bread. And we're going to have communion in just a moment. But he picks up the bread. And Jesus blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. As he was holding that bread up, he said, This body, or this bread, represents my body, which is broken for you. We often point out that we use unleavened bread in this church. Leaven in the Bible, or yeast, is a type of sin. And Jesus was absolutely sinless. And so the Lord Jesus Christ told them about the bread. And then Isaiah puts it this way. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Well, they passed the bread around. And then Jesus picked up the cup. And as he picked up the cup, he was saying to his disciples something that he was saying to us today, that this juice represents his shed blood. He put it this way. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it unto them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this blood, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remissions of sin. Again, going back to the book of Isaiah, it says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus, as he instituted the Lord's Supper, said this, 
But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went to the Mount of Olives. Well, the next part of the story, of course, is Good Friday, which we had a few days ago, and talking about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you think of what Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary, he uh, hung on that cross and he bore our sins. And what I'd like to do is look at it this way. There's a <clears throat> kind of the famous seven last sayings of Christ on the cross. And I'd like to look at each one of those very briefly and look at what they represent. For instance, when Jesus was hanging on that cross, he looked at these people who were crucifying him and he said, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Lord Jesus Christ, in spite of the fact that he was being unjustly crucified, unjustly punished, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Well, this speaks, of course, of the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then as Jesus was hanging on that cross, there was a thief on this side, and there was a thief on this side. The thief on this side railed against Jesus, and he said, if you were really the Son of God, then get us all off these crosses. But the one on this side said, Master, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And the second saying of the cross, Jesus looked at him and he says, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. This speaks, even in the, in the face of death, it speaks of hope. The hope that the Lord Jesus Christ gave. And then at the foot of the cross... There was Mary, his mother, and there was the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, uh, John. And he looked at them, and he looked at Mary, and he said, Mary, behold your son. And he looked at John, and he said, John, behold your mother. And what Jesus was saying there is that he, in the, even in the face of death again, he was showing care for the mother who brought him into this world. And then, as he was hanging on that cross a little bit later, he said in the Hebrew tongue, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, for the first time, Jesus could not, the Father could not look on Jesus because he was bearing our sins. And again, that speaks of loneliness. Jesus had never experienced that before. Never been apart from the presence of the Father in that sense. And yet, he had to cry, God, why are you forsaking me? He was bearing your sins and my sins on the cross. Then as he, again, hung on that cross, he said, I thirst. I thirst. We see the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ as he was physically and spiritually suffering for our sins on Calvary. And then the sixth saying of the cross is kind of an interesting one. Because in the King James Version it says, it is finished. But really in the original language it's one word. Finished. It's not a cry of defeat. It's a cry of victory. Jesus was saying, I have finished the work of redemption. I have done everything that's necessary for you to have salvation. And then finally, as he was on that cross... The last words that Jesus spoke were these. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He was bleeding from a 
As we come to this part of the story, Jesus is dead. And Joseph of Arimathea, a very wealthy man, went to Pilate and he begged for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Pilate acquiesced and said, go ahead and take the body. Well, Jesus was put in that tomb. But those, the Pharisees and the high priest, wanted to make sure that uh, Jesus did not come out of that tomb. Because they knew his disciples had said he would rise again, and he had said it. And so they took the tomb, and as you know, they put that large stone in front of it. <clears throat> and then they took and sealed the tomb. The way they would do that is they would take a, a cord and put it around the stone. And then they would have wax on each side, and they would put the seal of Rome on it. And just note that that seal and the guards that they had around was a positive confirmation of the reality of the resurrection because no one could have gotten into that tomb or gotten out of that tomb without breaking that seal and you could only break that seal if you had authority from Rome. Well, as you read the scriptures, everybody is very discouraged at this point. The disciples are despondent. They watched Jesus die on Calvary. His mother watched her son be crucified and die. Everybody, it was really depressing. And they thought, it's over. It's over. And then came Sunday. <laughs> Thank you. 
the empty tomb. Before daybreak, a few of the ladies, about three of them, went back to the tomb after, after the Sabbath was over. <coughs> they went back to the tomb and they were going to anoint the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they had a problem, so they thought. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? Well, when they got to the tomb, of course they saw something that they didn't expect. They expected to see that stone over the tomb. They expected to see that Roman seal. But the Bible says, And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed uh, thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living? among the dead. He is not here, but he is risen. Then they said this, Remember how he spake unto you while he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and returned to the sepulcher, and told all these things to the eleven, and to all the rest. Well, as you look at the story, Mary Magdalene took great pains to go and see Peter and John. And I, I was reading this and I said, it's really strange what Mary said. Listen to the scripture. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, and saith unto them, listen to what she says, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we know not where they have laid him. <coughs> Mary, what do you mean they've taken him? Didn't, didn't he tell you he was gonna come out of that grave? Didn't he tell you he was going to be raised from the dead? What do you mean? Well, it seems to me that she still wasn't getting it. Like a lot of people don't get it today. Folks, listen. Jesus is not on the cross. Jesus is not in the grave. Jesus Christ is alive today. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, Paul was writing about that. The significance of the resurrection is, is violent. We understand what it really means. Paul put it this way. If in Christ, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and you were yet in your sins. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most <coughs> miserable. He is saying that even if Jesus was born of a virgin, and he was, and even if he lived a sinful life, a sinless life, excuse me, a sinless life, and he did, and even if he was crucified, and even if they put him in the grave, if he had not come out of that grave, then we would not have Christianity today. We would not have salvation. Paul was writing about the gospel in that same chapter of 1 Corinthians. And a lot of people, if you ask them the question, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Most people say, well, it, it's good news, and certainly it is that. But do you really understand what the gospel really is? Let me read it to you. Paul put it this way. Moreover, brethren... I declare unto you the gospel. Now Paul says, I'm going to tell you what the gospel is, which I preached unto you, which also ye receive, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. And then he explains the gospel. For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. The first part of the gospel is the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus had to die for the gospel to become a reality. Secondly, and, and he was buried. You see, Jesus Christ not only had to be crucified, but he had to be buried. And then he goes on to say, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So the, true, the Bible is the true history of the Lord Jesus Christ, as someone said, it is his story, the story of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the gospel. Have you received the gospel? You see, oftentimes on Easter, we talk about the resurrection of Christ as we're doing today. But I wanted to give you the full impact that Jesus came into the city, that he was crucified, that he was buried, and thank God that he came out of the grave. And John 17, 3 puts it this way. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, 
whom thou hast sent. And I'm wondering this morning, I'm wondering, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ? 